Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Watts, and this is an introduction to the course Okta Customer Identity for Developers. I've had been privileged to teach in face-to-face -face in virtual classrooms for over 20 years. The virtual experience gives you the chance to interact with your instructor and fellow students, either through audio or over chat. It's your choice, depending on how comfortable you are with one, the other, or both. The focus of this class is on authentication. The various methods enabled through Okta, either through direct sign-in or through federation with external identity providers and implementing them. You'll also be introduced to both event and inline hooks. But more importantly, you'll have the opportunity to participate in a live hands-on environment where you can get a personal experience with implementing the various concepts covered. During this course, there are going to be many topics. We'll start with Okta's platform capabilities, the different ways that people use Okta and our APIs. You'll be introduced to the administrative tools because we need to understand how to configure Okta even as developers. For instance, if you wanted to go in and change a policy for passwords, sign-on, uh, multi-factor authentication, you need to understand how to go into Okta and configure it. Uh, we're also going to cover the Okta REST APIs, including the architecture and the design principles. We're going to use a tool called Postman. Okay, Postman is an API client, so we're going to be able to make API calls without writing any code and get used to more popular APIs uh, request and response messages. Uh, we'll discuss uh, migrating, registering, and managing users, including planning considerations and activation flows. And we're ultimately going to create a registration page using an SDK. Um, you'll learn the various authentication options that are available through Okta. Uh, we're going to implement the five customer identity possibilities, ranging from the Okta hosted sign-in widget uh, uh, through completely writing all of the code to access Okta's various uh, authentication APIs. Uh, you're going to understand the benefits to your organization of each option. You'll also understand and be able to implement multi-factor authentication through the use of policies. Uh, you're going to get a chance to fully implement each of the authentication options that involve either using the sign-in widget uh, to using one of our client-side or server-side SDKs. You're also going to learn of uh, event and online hooks. Um, on uh, hooks enable you as developers to extend the functionality of Okta and incorporate additional external functionality that responds to events or extends the functionality in an Okta workflow. We're also going to spend some time working with external identity providers. First, you're going to be able to uh, authenticate into Okta through a SAML-based IDP, and then authenticate to Okta using uh, some social identity providers, such as Facebook or Google or LinkedIn. Uh, but throughout, you're going to be introduced to several resources, websites and repositories to further your knowledge of Okta development and provide you with the tools to make your implementation smoother. In this first lab, we're going to set up the Postman environment so that we will be able to make REST API calls against our Okta environment. Um, Postman is a, a free, free source um, download, so you can get that over the internet, uh, but it does make it a lot easier for us to work with uh, REST API calls to test. So in this first lab, we will set up the Postman environment. So to do that, let me uh, switch over to the environment. Um, I have my API token here that uh, we created, and we did that by going to Security API we created, a, we created a API token, and then once we did that, now we open up uh, Postman. Now, 
At this point, you can see that there are no collections over here to the left. There is no environment over here to the right. So in order to create at least a template for that, I'm going to go out to my class files, uh, go down to platform, go to the rest folder, and I have this template for a Postman environment. Now, in this particular case, the environment that we have is different than this. So I'm going to make that correct. And then we will also make a couple of changes here. So I will insert the API key and the current value. I will also um, identify the Okta preview that I'm using and also uh, the email suffix. So pretty straightforward as far as that goes. We'll go ahead and click on update. And um, at this point we can close that so that we can get to this new environment. So that takes care of one thing, but the next thing is we need uh, in the coming labs that we are going to need to work with some collections. So in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and click on import here and uh, where it has choose files, I'm just going to choose files and pre pretty much go to the same place that I was. But in this case, um, I'm going to go to collections and I'm going to, uh, well, basically select and open all of these. And you can see that it did import a number of collections here. Um, now, the nice thing about collections is you can think of collections as a very general use case. Uh, I'll give you an example. Users would be a very general use case. If you are working with security, uh, authentication, authorization, whatever, you will need to work with users. Now, if you look in a collection, there will be a number of sub-collections that are more specific uh, use cases. For example, I might want to create a user, or I might want to work with credential operations, uh, lifecycle management, might want to list users, and then there's a couple of other specific things that I might do with users. So get a user, get the current user, get assigned app links, uh, get groups for the user, you get the idea. So basically these collections identify what we are trying to do. So this concludes our first lab. In the second part of this demonstration, we're going to actually make our first API call and review the request. So I showed you about collections. So now let's look at in the users uh, collection, we will see that there is this list users. All right, so if we go into list user and there's just this simple list users. Now notice that I have already closed any other tabs here. So watch what happens when I click on this particular context menu. So notice that it created a tab that says get list users. That tells me what I'm doing, but it also tells me the HTTP verb that I'm going to be using, get, and it identifies here the actual API call. Now, if you notice that there's this URL. Now, when we set up the environment, we pointed the URL, or at least uh, the URL to the um, Okta preview. And so notice that undercurrent, it does have that. So it knows how this is supposed to be, uh, how this is supposed to be done. Now, um, if you notice here, the API slash V1, um, is uh, as slash users corresponds with the user's API endpoint, and you can use this API to manage users. Now, in this specific request, you are searching for users, and you're going to be using the limit query string parameter to identify that we only want at most 25 results. Now, if we click on the headers tab here, um, you can see that 
uh, for authorization, there is this value of SSWS, and then there's this uh, API key. Now, in this case, this is the API key that I um, that I uh, um, um, pasted in there. There we go. Uh, pasted in there, and so there we go. Now. If you go all the way to the right, notice that over here we also have this code link over on the right hand side. And the cool thing about the code link is that uh, I have a number of different uh, different languages that I could potentially create. But the idea here is that I can create a code snippet. And so for instance, if I were to choose uh, CURL, notice that it applies everything that I need to be able to create um, code, at least in the Linux environment. So um, if we, uh, if we uh, click here, notice that I can make a copy of that code. Um, also, um, if we go back here, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close that, but if we go back and we, uh, we look at, uh, um, the, the list users collection, um, we can basically go down and we can see. So what happens if we make a call? Well, um, once I make a call, it's going to send the appropriate message to um, iOcta Preview. And as you can see down here, we got a status of 200. So everything worked fine. And now let's just kind of scroll down here. And then here is a response. So in this particular case, we have uh, a class admin is, um, is one of the users in our uh, setup. We also have a uh, backup admin as a user. And we also have a Octa service as a user. And we also have a test user, K West. And that should be it. So notice that each user has uh, information. It has an ID about the user, um, has information. Now, one other thing that you'll find is that when we look at, uh, for example, the headers, um, and I, if I go down, uh, we're using uh, JSON as our content type, but if we go down just a bit more, we talked about uh, rate limits, API rate limits. And so for this user's call, the API rate limit says that I can make 600 calls in every 60 second period, and in this case, this was my first call. Now, this reset is a, well, it's a timestamp. So it lets me know when that 60 second period is over. So basically, that is making our first API call with Okta. Now that we've identified the different create user requests, it's time to create a user. Now, in this case, we are going to, I've completely shut down all of the different tabs because we're going to look at creating an activated user with password and recovery question. So again, we're going to go to the body tab and inside of the double quotes, we're going to put the first name, the last name, uh, et cetera. Now in this case, as far as the password goes, we're going to uh, override the environment variable here, and we're actually going to uh, put in um, our own password that we want. Um, also, uh, rather than uh, this recovery question, I'm going to change it to uh, favorite soccer team. And the only trick is that we just want to make sure that um, that everything is, of course, in the double quotes. 
Now, again, if we're going to add in uh, some additional, we can add a comma. So let's say we wanted to also include a nickname. Uh, perhaps we wanted to include their title. Department. and maybe their division as well. All right, I'm not going to put a comma after the last one. And so we want to make sure that everything is correct. So everything ends with a, or is separated by a comma. Um, we have uh, the appropriate, looks like everything is spelled correctly. So at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and click on send. And it's going to send that body to the appropriate user result. Looks like I got an OK. So again, it identifies that uh, we're good to go. So we now have a active user that was just created. Um, we have a ID, so a user ID. We have a profile. Uh, we do have a uh, verified email. We have the uh, recovery question that we just did. So that uh, confirms that uh, we did create a new user. Now, uh, there are also some additional links at the bottom that I showed you, but let's... Uh, See if we can better see that. So uh, notice that the links provide additional REST API requests that you can make for a user. Uh, and so this uses uh, basically uh, how um, hypermedia application language, uh, it uses that standard. Uh, and so you could uh, potentially work with that. Now, now that we've created this user, I'm going to go ahead and minimize Postman, go back in here. Uh, I'm going to sign out as an administrator. And I should be able to sign in. Now the user is active, uh, already had a security question, so no reason to ask for that. And uh, looks like we're doing good. So at this point, gonna go ahead and click on that. Maybe. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and sign out as Okta. And that concludes our lab on creating a user. In lab 2-2, we're going to review the different create user possibilities in the uh, user collection. And so, and then we will go ahead and create users. All right, so the first thing is, is that if we look at our create user sub collection, we'll see that there are a number of possibilities. Now let's just kind of look at each one. So then the first one, there is this create user with password and recovery question. So if I go ahead and open that, notice that I've got my URL, I've got my slash API slash V1 slash users, very similar to the previous demonstration. And we have activate equals false. Now, if we look at the body of this, we'll see that there is a first name, last name, email, login. Um, we are actually going to pass in the password as well as a recovery question. So pretty straightforward. Now, on the other hand, if we look at create activated user with password and recovery question, the only difference between this one and this one is that we're going to set the activate query parameter to true. 
okay? But notice that the body itself is, um, is still there. Now, what if I wanna create a user without credentials? Well, in this case, again, we have same URL, same a, uh, API call, activate is set to false, but in this case, we don't have the section that deals with the credentials. Again, create activated user without credentials gives us an activate equals true, but still no credentials. Now, if we want to pass or we want to create the user with a password, notice that again, activate is false, but in this case, we have passed the credentials password. We can also create an activated user, which of course the activate is true, uh, and is exactly the same as the previous possibility. Now, in the first two with the password and the recovery questions, or without credentials, obviously the credentials are the password, but we could also have some kind of recovery question. The only difference is, is whether the activate is true or false. So in this case, no password, but we do have our recovery question. And same thing here, we change the activate principle to true, um, but yet the same information. And then of course we could potentially create that user in a group. Now notice that the users are there, uh, the activate in this case is false, but we can identify the group ID or IDs in order to do that. So there are a number of possible ways to create a user, but notice that they are not terrifically different from one another. You've had the opportunity now to see some of the things that you could learn in class. If you'd like to learn more and get some hands-on experience, I'd like to see you in class. So register now.